People have to learn how to change their brain waves to get into their autonomic nervous system to begin to reprogram. The latest research in neuroplasticity tells us we're not hardwired to be a certain way for the rest of our lives. The latest research in epigenetics says we're not doomed by our genes, that in fact we're marvels of adaptability and change. So as a person started to contemplate and think about who do I want to be when I open my eyes, what would it be like to be happy? What would it be like to live a new life? The frontal lobe is looking out into the landscape of the entire brain because it has connections to the entire uh, neocortex and it's got to resolve the problem. So it starts calling up different networks of neurons that are relevant to the question based on the knowledge the person learns or, or the experiences that they had. And it begins to seamlessly piece together this new understanding and that's called intention. And so if you're reading a book about how to become more happy or if you're reading a book on how to be a leader in your life or you're you're studying the process, every time you learn something new, you add new connections to your brain. So now you have the raw materials for you to imagine even more. The act of mentally rehearsing begins to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like it's already happened. Now the brain is typically a record of the past, but the moment we install the neurological hardware, it becomes a map to the future. And you keep doing that, the hardware becomes a software program, which means you start thinking like a genius. You start acting like a happy person because there's no mystery there because you installed the circuits. And then... These people didn't wait for their wealth or their health to feel gratitude and to feel empowered or to feel love, a love for life. They began to feel those emotions ahead of the experience. And their body as the unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between the experience and their life that creates the emotion and their emotion that they're creating by thought alone. The body's believing it's living in the future, in the present moment. And the stronger the emotion that they felt, the more they're going to pay attention to the thoughts they're thinking. And now all of a sudden, they're changing their biology from living in the past present reality to living in the future present reality. And I was so intrigued by this process that I went back to school to study neuroscience because it was the answer. In the internal process of rehearsing and imagining, they had long moments where they lost track of time and space. Where when they opened their eyes, they thought it was maybe 15, 20 minutes later, and it was an hour and 15 minutes later. When we get into the present moment, there's a moment where you lose track of yourself. You forget about yourself. And only in the present moment do you have access, according to the quantum model of reality, to other possibilities. And when you're truly in the present moment, the generous present moment, that's the moment then that you are no longer living in the familiar past or the predictable future. And in order for us to change, I realized that we have to get beyond our environment. And what's our environment made of? People, husbands, kids, bosses, objects, things, places. You gotta get beyond your emotions, your body, your pain, your disease. And you gotta get beyond this concept of linear time. So when we get beyond our body, our environment and time, we become pure consciousness. And now that consciousness can begin to connect to the consciousness of the field. And all of a sudden I realized that when people are nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time, that's the moment. They're no longer a face, they're no longer a culture, they're no longer a skin, skin color, they're no longer a mother, they're no longer a grandmother, no longer a, a doctor, or an attorney, uh, they're no longer a, a nurse, they're, they're pure consciousness. And that is the element that we begin to connect to something greater. So I wrote a book about it. And um, then I wound up on this documentary called What the Bleep Do We Know? And that became an overnight sensation. And we did all these conferences, all the scientists all over the world. And at the end of every conference, we had panel discussions. And I started listening to the people's questions uh, during those panel discussions. And they asked really three important questions. How do we do it? Which is a good question. How do our thoughts affect our body or our life? Second question, if our personality creates our personal reality, and it does, and our personality is made up of how we think, how we act, and how we feel, in order for me to change my personal reality, I have to change my personality. Why the hell is it so hard to change? And I thought that was a really good question. And the third thing was, what do you do? So I started teaching 
these Friday night, all day Saturday events and giving people the understanding of brain science and brain waves and the quantum model and showing them pictures of neurons connecting and disconnecting what neural nets are and how the brain works and what focus concentration looks like and begin to create something where people could really begin to practice at home. And basically I said, okay, well, if these are the four principles that these people used in my first book uh, to heal based on my investigation, it should work for sick people or normal people. The process is exactly the same. We got to unlearn and relearn. We got to break the habit of the old self, reinvent the new self. We got to unfire and unwire and refire and rewire. We have to prune synaptic connections and sprout new connections. Unmemorize emotions stored in the body. And then we have to recondition the body to a new mind and to a new emotion to stop signaling the same genes in the same way and begin to signal new genes in new ways to pull our attention and our energy out of the familiar past and begin to invest our attention and energy into a new future, to go from the known to the unknown. The model was built and we started doing these workshops all over the world, from Australia to Mexico, to Colombia, to Canada, to the United States, uh, to South Africa, to all over Europe. We were teaching these events. And, you know, to be honest with you, the first year I didn't see many changes. We saw some people get a, be happier, a, a greater sense of well-being but no real breakthroughs. But at the end of these introductory level courses, people would ask, can we teach, can you teach another level? So then I taught a level two. And then at the end of that, they said, could you teach another level? Then we taught a level three. And then they said, can you teach another level? And I said, I don't know anything else. But right around that point, I started having some really profound mystical experiences. Those mystical moments were so profound that I couldn't go back to be Joe Dispenza again. And all of a sudden, I realized that every time I had one of those mystical moments, the first thing that I came to when I came back to who I was, was I have this all wrong. Like, like some layer of conditioning, how we're so unconscious to how we view the world. Some layer, some veil was lifted. And then all of a sudden I got very passionate about the mystical. And so we started teaching a level 3.5. And then right around this time, all of a sudden, People started sending the emails in. My God, I was diagnosed with this condition. I was trying to get this job and I changed my energy. And I changed this and I started doing the work and my body's healthy. Here's the blood tests, here's the scans. And all of a sudden we started seeing that it started to catch on. And so I wrote my second book called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. It was a great success and, and there was a great meditation in there and a how-to. And, uh, and I, watched, I watched many people right around this point, uh, start to make really profound changes in their health right during our events. So we went from a level 3.5 to a level 3.5 pi, and we started seeing spontaneous remissions right in our events. And all of a sudden I knew that I had to change everything. So then I gathered a team of scientists and researchers and said, what is going on here? I knew that it was happening in real time. So I gathered a, a team of researchers and scientists and we started measuring. We started measuring brain waves. We started, we've done over 8,000 quantitative scans on the brain. We measure people to come in, that came into our event. We started doing four and a half day, five days events so that we could have people for a substantial amount of time measure their brain before they came at the end of four or five days, measure their brain at the end. And I would say, I want to know the changes are not just in their mind. And all of a sudden, we realized that we had, in our first two advanced workshops, these four and five day events, when we started studying the brain scans, 91% of the people that came had a more than 80% change in their brain for the better. So we knew that we were doing something really right. And then we started randomly selecting different people and we started studying their brains when they were going through the process of internal change. In other words, in real time, I wanted to know what those elements were that allowed the person to connect. I can tell you that the personality doesn't change the personality. I can tell you the ego doesn't change the ego. I can tell you that matter takes a long time to change matter that the brain takes a long time to change the brain. Only when you become pure consciousness, that consciousness is the phenomena above the brain and matter. And we started realizing that when people are stressed out or they're emotional and they start analyzing themselves and their lives within some disturbing emotion, they make their brain worse every time, not just once or every time. So we did over um, 5,000 HRV scans on the heart because when you're stressed out and when you're impatient and when you're frustrated, the heart beats out of rhythm because it believes that there's a predator behind the corner here or you're worried about the next thing that's going to happen. You're, you're switching on the survival centers. And so 
it takes a clear intention and elevated emotion to begin to affect matter and the nature of reality. So you got to open your heart. And I wanted to teach our students how to make that a skill. And we could measure them when they do it. And when you feel gratitude and appreciation and love and kindness and care, your heart starts beating in rhythm. It starts beating in a coherent pattern. When you start getting beyond matter and bodies and people and things and you take your attention and you open your awareness to space to nothing the brain gets super coherent we've measured it thousands of times and so we just got better at teaching the process and our students can create brain coherence and change their brain waves in four seconds five seconds nine seconds 12 seconds 15 seconds they just know, it's a skill they know how to do it and and when i say go into heart coherence they know how to do that they can they can do it for 45 minutes and why is it important because so many times in our life we go unconscious and we disconnect and when the heart is beating coherently it produces a measurable magnetic field that can be up to 3 meters wide that's that's a magnetic field that allows you to begin to spread your energy mm -hmm. and that energy is a frequency and frequency carries information and now that energy can carry the thought of your abundance and carry the thought of your wealth because all thoughts have a frequency the emotion of guilt the energy of of suffering cannot carry the thought of abundance or health because it's not the same energy and just like you could say i'm healthy i'm healthy i'm healthy i'm healthy with your conscious mind and if your body's been emotionally conditioned into unhappiness or pain that thought never makes it to your body and there's no connection between the mind and body so when people elevate their emotional states like in a state of gratitude. The emotional signature of gratitude means the event has already happened. It means when you, when you give thanks, you're getting something. So when you start giving thanks, your body's in a perfect state of receiving. So we want people to change their energy and to create this heart coherence, and we want to measure them. We want to know that we can say to them, you're doing it or you're not doing it. So we measured the energy of the room because we started seeing people saying, wow, the energy is incredible. And so many of our events in the 19 different advanced workshops we did in the last five years, the energy in the room has always gone up. We measured the energy around people's bodies. If you're freeing your body from the chains of those emotions that keep you anchored from the past, you should go from particle to wave, from matter to energy, liberating energy and freeing your body. So we measured the energy centers of the body because we teach our students that each one of these energies Energy centers are centers of information. They have their own frequency. Uh, they have their own intent. They have their own consciousness. They have their own glands, their own hormones, their own chemicals, their own individual little brains. And they're under the control of the autonomic nervous system. So people have to learn how to change their brain waves to get into their autonomic nervous system to begin to reprogram uh, these different energy centers. And I thought, well, people are healing, but let's find the instruments that show us that those uh, those changes are actually scientifically based so we found an instrument in russia and we measured uh, thousands of people's uh, energy we also have done measurements on immune regulation uh, and we found that uh, just a few times a day 10 minutes a day for four days just elevating your emotional state will strengthen your immune system by more than 50%. Yeah, we've measured genetic genetic changes. We've measured 7,500 different gene regulations, and our students have changed their genetic expression in four days. Genes that downregulate tumors and cancer growth, genes that are responsible for neurogenesis, not just making new connections, but the growth of new neurons in response to novel experiences and learning. The gene that stimulates or downregulates oxidative stress and begins to cause the body to move back into balance, anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative. The gene that activates stem cells to go to damaged tissues and repair them. The gene that activates microtubules. The microtubules are the skeletal structures of the cell that vibrate and, and emit light, coherent light and information. And when cells are diseased or out of balance, those different harmonics are causing the cells to emit different frequencies and the frequencies can't carry the information and that's what causes the cells to begin to break down. Well. We, know, we now know that the microtubules, the gene when the microtubule gets signaled, that they're resonating at a greater frequency. 
And so our, our most recent research was uh, measuring telomere lengths. And telomeres are the little DNA shoestrings that every time a cell divides, it gives up a little of that shoestring. And so the, the body begins to biologically age. So my question was, could we reverse that? So we randomly selected 32 people. We asked them to do meditation for 60 days. And 74% of those people had a change for the better. And they're telling me our length, we had 40% have a significant change. And we had 23% have a dramatic change. In other words, they got a certain percentage of their life back. One lady, we measured the telomeres at the beginning of the event. Four days later, we measured the telomeres, and we measured the telomeres 60 days later. The scientist said to me, you're not going to see any changes in telomeres four days later, because telomeres, as I understand, they're like, it's like hair or fingernails. They take time to grow. But I said to the scientists, we're witnessing people get their hearing back in one meditation. Why not once, not twice, not three times? We have people with skin rashes come out of a meditation and the skin rash is gone. They're getting a biological upgrade. So I said, well, if it's happening in no time, it's not a Newtonian phenomenon. It's not matter changing matter. Like we're talking about energy changing matter, which is a quantum phenomenon. I said, if that's happening, is it possible that their telomeres could lengthen in a very short amount of time? And he's, he paused for a long time, and then he said, you know, I think it is possible. I said, well, I'm willing to spend the money to see if it's true. And we had one lady lengthen her telomeres in four days, which is really, really significant. So, uh, so anyway, so I gathered all this data, and I wrote a book called You Are the Placebo, Making Your Mind Matter. And I thought, well, hell, if you understand the science of the placebo, you know, giving someone a sugar pill or a saline injection or performing some false surgery or procedure, a certain percentage of those people will accept, believe, and surrender to the thought that they're getting the real substance or treatment, and they begin to program their autonomic nervous system to make the exact pharmacy of chemicals equal to the substance they think they're taking. Now, that's not light dinner conversation. That means then that that pill, which is an inert substance, is a symbol that represents a possibility in the quantum field. 